I'm Steph. And I'm Jeff. Each week, we review a film that's streaming on Netflix or Amazon Prime. As writers, we'll deep dive into the hook, plot, characters, and indie to tell you if it's a good story. Listen at your own risk. This review contains spoilers. Now sit back. Relax. And and enjoy enjoy Stream on. On. Today, we'll be discussing Rebecca, streaming right now on Netflix. After a world room romance in Monte Carlo with rich and handsome widower Maxime de Winter, a newly married young woman arrives at Manderley, her husband's massive family estate on the English coast. She finds herself battling the legacy of Maxime's first wife, the seemingly perfect Rebecca. From every item in the estate marked by a monogram R to the obsessed housekeeper Mrs. Danvers, The new wife feels under attack by a woman she never met. Rebecca is directed by Ben Wheatley. It's written by Joe Shrapnel, Jane Goldman, and Anna Waterhouse. It's based on the 1938 novel by Daphne du Maurier. uh, And there was an original film adaptation of this novel in 1940 by the great Alfred Hitchcock. It stars Lily James as Mrs. De Winter. Army Hammer as Maxim de Winter, and Kristen Scott Thomas as Mrs. Danvers. So I chose this movie. Um, It was recommended by a friend of ours that likes um, romance, and she tends to like twisted romances with troubled men, like dark troubled men and so (laughs) we decided um based on her recommendation to try this one out i also am a huge hitchcock fan and i'd seen the original rebecca and so i was curious what they would do with an adaptation of an already great movie i think it's risky to adapt um alfred hitchcock but i was curious to see um what they did with that um so that is why i picked this movie So, um, Jeff, what did this movie remind you of? It reminded me of the original Rebecca, the 1940 version. Uh, Ah, unoriginal. (laughs) I mean, it reminded me of a very inferior version of that. Hitchcock's amazing. Um, He's one of my favorites. Um, interestingly enough, I, after watching this movie, I went to see if I could find the original Rebecca to watch it just to compare it. Um, cause I saw it years ago and you cannot get this movie on any streaming service. You would have to buy it in the Hitchcock Criterion collection to actually watch it. Or just go on YouTube. Oh, is there like a a dub? For, yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess you yeah, could do that right. too. I have watch it. It's on, it's on YouTube. Oh, ah, yeah. okay. Uh, well, good to know. But yeah, I was just surprised. Like you could get almost every movie streaming. So I was, I was surprised when it wasn't available even to purchase on the major streaming platforms. The movie I chose is the Guillermo del Toro film from 2015, Crimson Peak. Have you seen that one, Jeff? I have not. Oh, you should check it out. You you might like it. It's so that one stars um Tom Hiddleston, who, who we all love as Loki from the Thor movies, um, Jessica Chastain and Mia Wasikowska. Um and it's like it's a mystery horror romance, uh, and it's period. So while Rebecca takes place later in the 1930s, Crimson Peak takes place um, like late 1800s, early 1900s. It's Victorian Gothic, but the themes are similar. So you have this like young, pretty blonde woman full of life that is seduced by an older, handsome, troubled man who has money and they it's very quick romance and then he whisks her away in crimson uh peak he whisks her away to his old manor house that's isolated in the english countryside very similar to in rebecca she gets romance quickly and then whisk away to manderley which is a, a grand old manor house in 
the isolated English countryside. And there's also another parallel, a mysterious housekeeper um, in Crimson Peak, it's the sister um, that Jessica Chaston plays that character, who is stern and not very welcoming. And you can tell she's hiding some secrets. Um, and in Rebecca, it's Mrs. Danvers, um, who also is stern, unwelcoming, and hiding some secrets. So a lot of parallels. Um, I would say overall Crimson Peak is a better movie. It's um, It's got a lot more, like, Victorian Gothic horror. It's more horror, um, and it's it's beautiful. Like it, the way it's filmed with all of the costumes, um, it's it's beautifully shot. Um, so if you were you pseudo like Rebecca, but you're eh about it, it may, you might try Crimson Peak out to get that similar feel, but a better movie. Okay, The Hook. Well, it does have a good opener. You basically have the same line from. The, that opens the book about this woman kind of dreaming about going back to Manderley. You know that the rest of the movie is going to be basically flashbacks. You know something has happened to this place. So it does kind of draw you on it that you want to see what happens. The rest of the film, or I should say the rest of the hook, is fine. You do get a bit of the uh, two main characters, Lillian. Uh, well, I'm going to call her Lily. I know it's the actress's name, but we never actually find out her name, so it'll be a lot easier. Lily comes across as kind of a fantasy creature. I mean, she's attractive, spunky, reads a lot, is an artist, knows lots of kind of obscure stuff, but she's just awkward enough to be attractive to guys who want someone who is not going to be better than them which actually sort of fits the tone of the book and the first film which you you've read the book as well i have not read the book but i did go through and do some research on it ah. and they've made a few changes one of which was the age difference in the book and in the hitchcock version lily or the future mrs de winter is considerably younger than maxon he's in his 40s army hammer does not appear to be in his 40s. No, he looks to be about the same age as Lily. <laughs> so, right. yeah, there's not a... He just seems older because of time. Like, because of he's in grief and he's been through some trauma. So, like, you can tell he's a little aged because of that, but not much older than Lily. Right, he has just the right amount of darkness to be attractive for people who are looking at kind of bodice ripper cover sort of dude because mm -hmm. i mean he's otherwise perfect right he's charming sexy rich single and mysterious you know the mysterious. like you know girls like the sort of the bad boy or the mysterious boy um and and lily mrs de winter or whatever is um young enough and naive enough to to think that the love will basically smooth out any of the grief that he has. <laughs> um, and obviously we see that it's more complicated than that. But yeah, for me, the hook, I mean, it, it does what it needs to do. So yeah, you, you get this whole... Well, that's not it, though. That actually is not the end of the hook. The hook actually ends with them married and going to Manderley, because you then meet the third main character, Danvers. And there is that moment when... It, uh, the newlyweds arrive, and uh, it is clear that Danvers takes an immediate dislike to Lily, although we don't know why yet. To me, that's the end of it. Saying, okay, so here's your troika, right? You have Maxim, you have Danvers, you have the new wife, and you know that that's what's going to drive the story. And that's when the hook ends. So go ahead. <laughs> We've got the evil house starting out, um, and okay, so you know it's there's going to be some horror components to the movie, and that something goes wrong in this house. Um, and then, yes, it flashes back, and uh, it's it's beautifully shot. It takes place in Monte Carlo, so you've got um, Lily's character, who she's basically a, a lady's companion. She's a travel companion for a uh, wealthy which uh, a rich widow who's played by um, if any 
of you all have seen The Handmaid's Tale, it's played by um, the the lady. Oh, what is her name in The Handmaid's Tale, Jeff? Do you remember her? Um, oh, the nurse. Uh, Lydia. Lydia, yes, yes. Played by Aunt, uh, Lydia. Aunt Lydia. And the ham, yeah, who she does such a good job with that character. So it's interesting to see her in a, in a different role um, in this one. But still, like both of those roles, she takes on a bit of like this motherly demeanor. She's much warmer in this film than she is as Aunt Lydia um, in Handmaid's Tale. But yeah, so basically she is, she's hired this young girl um, who's not of means. Lily doesn't come from means. She's an orphan, um, but she uh, wants a travel companion. And so um, Lily's there with her on vacation in Monte Carlo, and that's where she meets Max and DeWinter. But early on, there's some signs of trouble, that this is not healthy, and she ignores the signs. Like, when she finds little, like, clues about Rebecca, he shuts her down right away, um, and uh, she, fa- like, she finds a book of love poems, and he gets, like, really awkward about it. Uh, it's clear there's some unprocessed grief there. Um, and he just, he romances her quickly. He knows her like a week, maybe two weeks. And then um, the rich widow, she's like, we're going to go to New York. Um, so you're going to come with me to New York. And Lily's just devastated because then she's going to uh, have to leave this guy she just met, Mr. DeWinter, that she likes so much. And um, so Maxim proposes to her. So my question to you is, is did you actually find really Lily or the character uh, played by Lily? Did you find her at all interesting? That was my problem with the hook. No, I she's just, I mean, nothing at all she's pretty. People. She was pretty and she, um, you know, was, uh, that was about it. She didn't really have anything else that struck me as that, you know, interesting, but Maybe that's what Maxim was looking for. It was just kind of someone to help him distract him from his grief about Rebecca and her very complex grief around Rebecca. And so she's the next pretty thing that came along and she entertained him enough. Um, But I wasn't very impressed with her that she would just marry this guy after knowing him one to two weeks with some early warning signs (laughs) But but that's the movie. This should be a warning to everybody um, that this is going to go south. A guy you barely know. But that is one of the problems of the hook is that it is not clear why they get married. So that she I mean, doesn't have to go that, to New York. That's- yeah, I mean, I understand that plot point, but I'm saying there is nothing particularly there that we see this that says romance. There's this one scene where she's like laying on the beach and he's putting sand on her back. And that's a little sexy. Um, That's probably the most like sensual romantic part. But I don't, the problem I had is I don't think the chemistry between these two characters was great. So I didn't made sense for them to just get hitched so quickly. Um, And throughout the movie, I felt the chemistry was, I, I just, neither of them did a great job um, establishing that tension and that chemistry between them, in my opinion. Well, and early on, and I agree with you, and a part of this because from the moment Lily uh, James is on screen, the way she overacts is annoying. It's like the little ticks she has about being a little nervous or whatever, they're all, to me, exaggerated. And especially compared to the standout performance that Chris and Scott Thomas turns in mm-hmm. it amplifies the fact that lily the, her, that char- her character is just not at all interesting and i didn't care what happened to her honestly and then they and well they do some things with their later try to make her more interesting which we can get to when we get into the plot but the hook is there it's just only elements work and i think the element to, for me was that literally opening scene when you know something's going to happen to Manderley. And then when we meet Danvers right at the end of that opening period, you get, okay, what is this woman's deal? What's her problem? What is going to be motivating her immediate dislike for the new Mrs. DeWinter? Yeah. But for me, the most interesting part of the hook was just the 
Monte Carlo it was beautifully shot and I thought they did a good job with the set design the characters themselves were not that interesting um, and I would agree with you that um, Kristen Scott Thomas's performance as Mrs. Danvers was really the shining performance in this film. Um, the other two were just not that great. I think they, I picked. I think they picked the wrong actors. This film had better, different actors that had better chemistry, and if they revved up the sexual tension, um, I think you could have had a better film. Well, I, I do have one question, and then we can move on. But this has to do with the casting. And also with the way the character uh, Mrs. De Winter is described in the book. So there she is described as fairly plain. In that sense, do you think that picking, and this is the same thing with uh, the Hitchcock version, the women who play Mrs. De Winter are both very attractive. It makes that sort of outsider, wallflower, not really tinted. It's harder to buy it with them. I'm trying to think who would have been a better casting choice, like an actress that has that's interesting looking, right? That's not like ugly, but interesting looking. And it's not like a bombshell could have been a better choice in that role. Mr. DeWinter, I think he should be handsome, but not in like the way Army Hammer is. Like, I think Mr. Winter, Mr. DeWinter would have been better played by someone that's kind of like a Johnny Depp or something like older darker handsome but with a little bit of just like roughness around them I mean, like a christian okay. bale I could have been that. good yeah. like they, they need to have more darkness army didn't have enough darkness for me well i believe in the hitchcock version it is uh, the role is uh played by Lawrence olivier but he plays it more as his distinguished middle age right some of the lines that he has in that movie about um, his future wife and how it's sad she ever has to grow older and things like that and some very kind of creepy almost fatherly uh lines that he has towards her i'm glad it didn't go with that in this movie but hammer is just too conventionally attractive there it's just he's just kind of generic he would be he play a good superhero like i he he would be great as like in, in a superhero costume um but yeah even like and i think that's why crimson peak worked really well because they chose tom hiddleston to play the main guy love interest with some secrets and and tom hiddleston you know he's attractive but in that a different that more that darker way not as conventional um and i think that worked better um for a character like that uh okay well so let's move on to the plot and the characters so, um, you know, we're, we're now in basically at the, at the house, right? We meet Mrs. Danvers and right away we can tell, okay, there's a part of this house that's off limits. Like there's a door and there's an entire wing where she's not allowed to venture to because that's where Rebecca stayed. Reminds me of like Beauty and the Beast and don't go in the, you know, the wing with the rose. And so naturally when you're told, oh, don't go in this part of the house, what do you want to do? Of course you want to know what's in that part of the house. So we know that's coming, right? They zoom in on that door very early on. Um, and then we see that um, there's some sleepwalking that a Maxim sleepwalks and then he'll walk into that part of the estate. Uh, and Mrs. Danvers is like, Oh, don't, don't leave him alone. Um, she very much is like always there and present <laughs> watching things and you want to know what's going on there. Um, and so, yeah, uh, basically the movie takes its time as you start unraveling the mystery about what happened to Rebecca. And, you know, it would be nice if she, like, I would have loved to see a stronger character where she's like, you need to just tell me what happened to Rebecca. Stop beating around the bush. Stop being cryptic. She doesn't really do that. She she tries to figure it out on her own, but she never confronts him directly and says, I need to know because there's a lot of weird stuff going on with Rebecca and I need your honesty about what happened. Um, so that bothered me. I just, she just struck me as a fairly weak character. A lot of this movie is, or a lot of the plot is driven by characters behaving in ways that are obviously counterproductive. 
So, so there's one incident where she accidentally breaks a statue. She being mm-hmm. the new Mrs. De, Win- De Winter, right? And instead of just calling a maiden and saying, hey, clean this up, she hides the broken pieces and gets some kid in trouble, one of the uh, people working in on the estate in trouble. And it's like, why? There's a lot of weird moments like that. I agree with you. Why did the, uh, why didn't Maxim j- just kind of sit her down and say, here's what my relationship with my wife was really like? Because there's a big reveal near the end where you learn of what it was really like and what this superficially perfect uh, dead wife Rebecca was like. Why not have that discussion early on? It's very contrived. It is. It is. Like, it would be nice if you had a lot more, like, I think they could have done some fun things with the two characters where, you know, maybe they have a really, like, this is supposed to be a romance, right? Where they have a really, like, spicy sex scene where he, like, calls her Rebecca or something like that. You could have really made it much more interesting um, about how he's haunted by Rebecca. But instead, it was just, like, I'm this these secrets and her going here and there trying to figure it out, um, which, you know, I they try to set up as a mystery, Um, But it's just not that interesting. I mean, we find out eventually she drowned in a sailing accident. Um, I think this is one of, like, my biggest critiques about the movie is that it tried to be three different things, and it didn't do any of those three things well. So it tried to be a mystery, uh, but the mystery wasn't that interesting. It tried to be a romance, but the chemistry wasn't there. And it tried to be a horror, but it wasn't scary. (laughs) <laughs> so it just never really got off the ground. Like if they did picked one track, if they had like revved up the romance and had some erotic sex scenes, okay, go that way. If they had revved up the horror and had the ghost of Rebecca, okay, go that way. Um, if they had create, made the mystery, I, I think they probably tried the mystery track the most. Um, and they have this like drawn out court thing at the end. Um, but it wasn't that interesting of a mystery. Uh, so yeah, it's just, yeah, it was, that was the problem is they didn't pick one track and stick with it. Well, I agree. That was a problem. A, a problem, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's one of the the major problems of the film. Um, there are just there's a lot of really weird moments. Uh, there's one moment where, as things are starting to deteriorate in the new home, and uh, Lily's character is feeling more and more isolated, and that everyone's talking at her back and everything, and she starts talking to her husband, and it's like, oh. I liked when we were in our honeymoon and going to, you know, different hotels and cafes. And she gets kind of a lecture from him about that's not real life. And I'm like, this dude lives in a palace, basically. She's a poor girl, an orphan. She probably knows a lot more about real life than than Maxime is ever going to know. And this is, I think, one of the problems with trying to adapt a older work into the modern age, whether you're doing it as a period piece or not, is that our expectations for a for for a female lead are different. The character in the first film is much more passive. The character in the book is fairly passive, so passive that she never gets a name, right? Here they try to tack on some Nancy Drew level sleuthing. But the problem is, even with that, so the climactic part of her uh, investigation is going to this doctor in London to his office. And he had examined Rebecca just before she was killed. Right. And the cousin, Favelle, mentions the, that he knows about the London connection. He's a critical but piece the f- there. But the thing is, so she gets this, gets her uh, medical folder, sees that unlike what she told, told Maxim before he shot her, she uh, wasn't pregnant with someone else's child. She had cancer and was going to die, right? So she finds this out, and this is the evidence going to exonerate her husband. But she finds it out literally moments before the cops show up 
and would have found out the exact same thing. So it's like her big moment of coming up with this new information is pointless. Again, with this character, is that they would clearly realize that having someone who is as completely passive as the character was originally written doesn't work with modern audiences. But they didn't go the whole way and say, we're going to basically restructure her, make a more 21st century version of what this character would be like. Mm -hmm. And someone who is more active and more take charge just until the end where they kind of tack it on. And I think that's a problem. But that, that to me, that's a problem with trying to adapt a, a piece of, you know, a fiction that is very much at the time it was written. Right, right. Yeah. And they, and, and by changing her character too much, it really changes the, the vibe of the story. Um, because Rebecca was not a passive woman, right? Rebecca was the opposite of passive. She was controlling. Um, and Correct. So basically what we find out since we're um, moving towards the ending here is we find out that Rebecca was abusing Maxim and that she was basically had him on the leash and she, she was saying, well, I'm going to live the life I want. I'm going to have all these suitors, including her cousin. She was sleeping with her cousin, Bavel. Um, and she said, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to go to London when I want. I'm going to sleep with my cousin. I'm going to sleep with men, have my parties and you can't do a thing about it because then that's going to ruin your name. You don't want divorce. Right. So she basically was controlling him. And, and so at, they have this um, scene in the boathouse where she knows she has the cancer and she's like, kill me basically. And he kills her and then he covers it up and makes it look like a drowning and like sinks the sailboat. Um, and then later the boat is unearthed. And so now there's a criminal investigation because they are thinking maybe foul play happened. Um, and the cousin tries to extort money from Maxim and Lily's now all of a sudden they, I think this really bothered me about her too is so she is not treated that well by Maxim he again treats her like shit because um of all his issues around Rebecca and then all of a sudden she finds out he killed Rebecca and but in you know some be, just get out of the abusive relationship so to speak and that she all of a sudden is just by his side she will stand by her man. She's going to ensure that he doesn't like go to <laughs> to prison, and she's gonna to make sure that um, she finds the evidence um, that uh, exonerates him. Like it didn't fit. Like she was fairly passive throughout the film, and then all of a sudden she's just standing by her man after she found out he killed his ex-wife, and she automatically believes his story too. Versus thinking there might be more to the story than that. Well, Maxim is a monster. Danvers is obsessed and kind of crazy. She's obsessed with Maxim. Rebecca. Is a monster. Yeah. But Mon Maxim is a monster. He is emotionally abusive. He's verbally abusive. He lies to his wife constantly. He doesn't sit her down and tell her anything about the previous relationship mm -hmm. until he has a loaded gun in his hand. There's that, there's a uh, moment about midway through the movie where there is a big masquerade ball and Lily decides she's going to come down wearing this costume. And it's basically the last costume that the dead wife, Rebecca wore. Maxim gets pissed. It humiliates her. Never explains why. Now, it is explained to her by another character. I didn't find him to be a good person at all. He was an awful person to her. And then, so for her to just be so, I'm going to stand by my man once she found this out, like, and not even think twice. She's such a Nancy Drew investigator type all of a sudden, but she's not going to be like, hmm, is he telling me the truth? That she was the one that abused him? really and that's why he had to kill her i yeah i like it just it didn't compute um uh, that she would all of a sudden just believe him that quickly and stand by him and and then and the ending is just ugh, like i was gonna say even if she takes at face value everything he says he is basically saying he murdered her because she threatened to embarrass him 
That's essentially it. So she was sleeping around. He knew it. She was, I guess, what wore the pants in the family. Oh, how how dare a woman be in charge? When she kind of confronts him about this, his response is to blow her away. And then and Lily, she's like, sure, that makes sense. But he explains it like she's like, kill me, kill me, put me out of my misery. And he does like he was basically doing what she wanted him to do. That's that's his version of reality. Yeah, <laughs> he learned some abuse tactics from from Rebecca. Um, they're they're all they're good at gaslighting. I, I would just say this uh, for those kids listening at home. Uh, do not try that argument in court. Oh. Yeah. That person begged me to shoot them. So, yeah, so they have this court trial. Favel tries to extract money and um, to for this guy's freedom, but it doesn't work, you know, and they find out that, yeah, she had terminal cancer. And, um, and so it's like a mercy killing. I guess that's how they kind of soften everything over is that it was a mercy killing. It wasn't killing her because she was pregnant, which is what they initially thought of why she saw the doctor. And then... Everything's all good. So Mrs. Danvers goes nuts. She she doesn't agree with how things happen, that this guy got exonerated. She's like, F you and F your house. And she burns down Manderley, um, which good for her. <laughs> She's pissed. She's like, she Mrs. Danvers knows there's more to the story and that this guy's getting away with murder. And so she's just like, F you, I'm going to burn down the house. There was something about Danvers that was interesting. It was something that... Uh, was changed from the book to the 1940 adaptation and then changed back to the original relationship in this version. So in the book, in this version, Danvers basically raised Rebecca. So it's a very obsessive, a kind of mother daughter thing, right? Right. It's interesting in the Hitchcock version, she starts helping out Rebecca after she's married oh she doesn't have that history okay no and now i am definitely reading way too much into this but i'm going to read into it anyway there is almost this kind of coded love affair there they're like she it's not a mother daughter it's i wanted her and never had her yeah it's a little bit of like i do remember that from the original hitchcock movie a little bit of lesbian overtones there yeah um i mean they don't have any scenes that actually where they're intimate but there's that tension yeah and basically if you were making films in the 30s and 40s well up until really into the 70s that kind of relationship would have been coded anyway you're not literally going to come out and say it because at that point it would have been censored but um, I thought that was interesting. But, you know, her obsession is it's a little overdone. But Kristen Scott Thomas is so good that I can buy that from her. Mm-hmm. I, she plays that kind of the icy exterior with like this infernal rage inside her that she's barely keeping under control. Mm-hmm. And it really works. She does a lot just with like a few glances and the pursing of the lips. Yeah, so she she's, is great in she's definitely, if you're going to watch this movie, watch it for her acting. Yeah. Cause I yeah, she, completely. she definitely captures um, that character. Well, and just the anger of like unrequited love. Like if like, cause there you did get that sense that if she does, she loves, she deeply loves Rebecca, but she never got Rebecca's love in return. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so she's like, F it all, burns down the house, and then, this is the worst, uh, this is, I hate this ending, I'm just gonna say, like, it's just awful, like, they just, um, like, gloss everything over, they've been through all this trauma, um, and let's not forget, he did kill Rebecca, um, and so then they just, they they live happily ever after, traveling the world, the, it ends with, um, her and him in Cairo looking at pictures of their world travels and kind of hearkening back to that whole when she's talking about how great their honeymoon was or they get to travel and he's like well that's not reality well apparently it becomes a reality that that's Mm -hmm. they have no more Manderley and he's got money and they're just gonna travel the world and live happily ever after and forget that this guy uh was dishonest with her when he romanced her was emotionally abusive throughout the relationship and 
killed his ex-wife, but somehow they're going to live happily ever after. Uh, well, terrible be- message to women. <laughs> well, I believe the last line is uh, something like this, is that uh, she learned that life is about saving the one thing working, walking, the sorry, saving the one thing worth walking through flames for love. And when I heard that, uh, I did audibly groan. Blah. I'm sitting here. I was just watching. It's like, wow. Well, and what's interesting about the ending in this version is that this is different than every other version. The book, the 40 film, there have been a number of other adaptations. As far as I know, as from what I've been able to find out, is that they all have a similar ending, which is... Manderley has been destroyed. Danvers is dead. But it's kind of ambiguous what's happening next. Mm. Right? This is, yeah, it's like she gets exactly what she wants. The hot, rich guy, they're going to live in hotels and have room service the rest of their lives. Yeah. Oh, great. And the guy is all of a sudden healthy without any kind of emotional abuse or murderous tendencies. That he's gotten that all out of his system. <laughs> well, it's interesting too. Is like the characters also uh, in the book. There, there was a a, a couple of sentences I pulled out, and I'm just going to read them really quick. Now, this is when Maxon is telling his uh, new wife about Rebecca. So near the end, right? And it's Maxon did not love Rebecca. He had never loved her. Never, never. They had never known one moment's happiness together. Maxim was talking, and I listened to him, but his words meant nothing to me. I did not really care. Her character is much more kind of like a a bit harder, I think, in the book, actually. Mm -hmm. Because that character is not someone at the end is going to go, I'm going to work through fire for love. Yeah, there was no growth. There was no, and and this goes back to the idea of trying to adapt something that's older um, to 2020 when we want strong female characters that grow through the film. Um, and um, a, a, you, the, a better ending would have been for her to walk away from this all and go and explore the world on her own as a strong, independent woman and leave this guy groveling in the ashes of manderley that would have been a better ending to me um he can he can hang out he and danvers can hang out together (laughs) um but she needs to free herself she and and maybe go to new york and find the rich old lady and she was nice like team back up with her um the rich old lady trying to warn her she tried to warn her about mary maxim but she didn't listen you could have done that. You could have leaned harder into uh, the second wife being just more of an operator, that she sees this as a meal ticket, right? Mm-hmm. That she goes in not as this naive waif, but as someone who's like, hey, this dude wants me. He has tons of money. I come from nothing. My hope in life was to be, what, the personal assistant to a bunch of rich assholes, now I can be the rich asshole. I mean, you could lean into that, keep a very similar storyline. That, though, would also explain her deciding, I'm going to stick with this guy who killed his wife. Because mm-hmm. this is part of the plan she has. The way it's laid out here is that she's a nice person until she helps this guy get away with murder. Right. Well, and another thing you could have done, which could have been a cool plot twist, is that she becomes the new Rebecca. That... She basically, you know, like she helps to get away with murder and it's like he owes her and yeah. she gets to call the shot. She's like, I'm going to help you with this, but you're going to be on, on my string now and that she can go and travel the world and she can go and have her romances with men in different parts of the world. And he's stuck foot in the bill <laughs> like that, I think, could have been a fun ending. 
<laughs> and because like he expects he's finally like done with a Rebecca type character, and he's like, no, got to deal with another one, Rebecca too. Um, but no, that didn't happen. Um, so yeah, just um, it was it, it's definitely a disappointing ending for um, character growth. That's for sure. And neither of these characters really grew in the film. Best part of the ending was the burning of Manderley and Mrs. Danvers. Yeah. She grew. She's like, I'm done with this. <laughs> Finally out. Okay. So what did you like best about the film, Jeff? Given what I said a little bit earlier about uh, Kristen Scott Thomas, it shouldn't be any surprise that I think that her performance and the Danvers character in general was the best thing about this movie. She was interesting. Thomas did a great job. Uh, again, portraying that icy exterior where you know there's a lot going on inside. And the character's relationship with both Rebecca and how that was playing out towards the new wife, I thought that worked fairly well. It was interesting to watch. Yeah. How about you? For me, I chose the, um, the set design. So I thought they did a really good job with the manor house it had a lot of like antique furniture and paintings and trinkets like they it really got you into the world of this like i felt like you could be entering a haunted house um and monte carlo that was beautifully done so whoever did like the costumes and set design for the movie did a great job with that um and yeah i i would say overall that's that was my favorite thing and your least favorite thing? Um, so, yeah, the chemistry, the, uh, the chemistry between uh, Lily and Army wasn't there. And for a movie driven on the chemistry between Maxim De Winter and Mrs. De Winter, I mean, that is the key part of the film. If you can't get that chemistry right, it's going to be hard to have a good film. Um, that, yeah, it just didn't work the, the wrong actors uh, maybe maybe they did the best they could with the script but i think you needed different actors and a better script um to have the chemistry between the characters so it's unfortunate okay. yeah i'm gonna i would just focus on lily james i did not enjoy her performance i don't know if i've ever seen her in anything else but she wasn't very good in this some of that certainly is just the character right and you know there's always that line of when you're judging a performance, how much of that actually is the actor's fault. But all I can say is I didn't like her performance. I didn't like the character. I didn't like the way she was written. I agree with you. There was really no growth until right at the end when it felt tacked on and artificial and not organic. So basically, the two female leads are the at the opposite ends of the spectrum for what's good and bad about this movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, okay, what's your final panda rating? So I decided to give this 1.5 pandas. And primarily, interestingly enough, uh, for the thing you like the most, production values. Um, I agree. They were really good. Very immersive. And then I would also obviously add uh, Chris and Scott Thomas into that too. The rest of it, meh. Yeah, so I I gave it, I was a little harsher than you. I gave it a one out of five. Um, yeah, it's just, um, I think I just didn't like this movie because of what it said about relationships and how like they, they tried to like couch it as they ultimately ended up having this healthy relationship and nothing in the film like indicates that this relationship will be healthy for uh, Mr. and Mrs. DeWinter as they travel the world. So it's just sort of glorified in my mind, the abusive <laughs> relationship um and and that that yeah you can meet a guy and only know him for a couple of weeks and get married and it'll all work out yeah I, I didn't like that I didn't like that messaging um and that I wanted to see this uh, you know me I like strong female characters I wanted to see her grow and not need this jerk of a maxim to winter but no um so 
it gets a point for the costumes and set design. I, I okay. do agree with you. Like, um, Kristen Scott Thomas did a good job acting, but I don't think she could salvage the movie. Um, so, yeah, the, to me, this is one I'd skip. If, if you're going to watch one, go. And I'm such a Hitchcock fan, too. Like, watch the original Hitchcock. Light a fire one night or some candles. And, like, watch the Hitchcock version. Watch, watch Laurence Olivier. Um, that don't, don't waste your time on this one. I agree completely. Thank you for joining us on Stream On. Tune in for our next episode when we'll be looking at Apostle currently streaming on Netflix. Stream On is a production of Steph and Jeff Wright's Media. Reproduction of this podcast without written consent is prohibited. All rights reserved, 2020.